He says go. We are live. So that's funny. Hello, everyone. I am Chris Gazdick, a mental health and substance abuse therapist. I have that book still out there, Rediscovering the Emotions and Becoming Your Best Self. So we welcome you to Through a Therapist Eyes, the podcast where you get personal insights directly from a therapist in your own home or personal time in your car. So as always, we uh, we invite you to see the world through the lens of a therapist, but being aware it's not to deliver therapy services in any way. We ask that you literally, you know, re- really, we need your help. And you can help us by subscribing to the show on your platform. Most shows have, or most platforms have a subscription button. It helps us out a lot, honestly. And particularly in Apple, I have learned different than my Spotify. Uh, not mine. I don't own it, Nicole. You'll know who <laughs> Nicole is in a moment. But in Apple, they have uh, leaving a ranking and a subscription. That really, really, really helps us out tremendously. Also, as you know, in the last few weeks, we've been highlighting how to contact us for questions and comments. 100% of the time answered by me. The best way is to privately email us at contact at therapistseyes.com. The same title as the show and uh, all the various social media outlets as well. Finally, check out the website, therapistseyes.com. Full show transcriptions, all the books and everything that we've talked about. We're getting that all together. This is the human emotional experience, and we will endeavor to figure this thing out together. So we have still... Um, going to follow the show, realize that we have guest co-hosts. We have changed our, our formatting to we will have a month with a guest co-host. We just ended up with Adam Cloninger. I think that worked out awesomely. And uh, next uh, week, we will start with a guy named Matthew Hanks. And we're, so we're really looking forward to that, bringing new energy to the show. It's been pretty neat, real fun to, to get different personalities and their energy with us. So that, no, and there's one other thing. We are also very much on the verge of doing the Facebook Live component. So we're growing. We're doing different things. It's kind of been exciting, neat, and fun. Y'all can get used to like Thursdays at 530 when we're recording live. We're going to hopefully be able to pop a camera somewhere somewhere here in the office and and let you watch along live with us. You can see my readers. <laughs> and yeah, we got readers, Cole. I tell you. Anyway, the uh, the Facebook lives will be will be a routine that you could check us out, you know, after work or whatnot as we're recording, and then from the Facebook live, we'll have it posted on the various platforms that we do. So let's fire it up. We have a guest with us. Her name is Nicole Bershback. Welcome to Through a Therapist Eyes, ma'am. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. It's exciting. Yeah, it, should be, it should be cool. I think that we've we've got a neat two part deal that we're kind of going to do today is going to be what we talk about. What did I title this anyway? A Healthy in- Family Environment in Parenting with Nicole Birschback. Sound cool? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big, it's an undertaking setting up that environment. So I'm excited to have a chance to talk about it. It's, it's funny, Nicole. I start these shows, man. And I'm kind of like, dude, I have so much to fit in. I don't know how we're, we're going to get to it all, but we're going to do our best. And then we're going to follow that up, though, with you have a podcast called Total. Yes. Right? Is it, is it called yes, Total? Yes, on Total. Potential? Yeah, on our Total Potential podcast, I can't wait because we're going to tap into some of your expertise on the marriage side, which is, you know, another big part of the work. So it's going to be awesome. Definitely part of the family environment, right? Yes. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So that's going to be kind of fun. And I think we're recording that Monday, so that should be up uh, live. We'll have the links and uh, we'll we'll, we'll get to that and how to find uh, Total total Potential in, in your show. So you are an unbeatable mind coach. A registered dietitian, which I think is wicked cool. I hope that we can get to some of the dietitian stuff. I, I know it's a whole nother show, but I definitely don't get to talk to a lot of people, you know, about how the dietary factors, you know, factor into mental health. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something that isn't talked about in my field, like at all. And I consider myself ignorant <laughs> to a certain extent with that, honestly. Yeah, so, it's, it's an interesting dynamic, the play between the two. Absolutely. Yeah, hopefully we can pull that in a little bit. So you're a registered dietitian and an NYT 200 yoga instructor, a mom of three and wife of one and only. I love the way you put that. I thought that was cool. (laughs) So He's my one and done. (laughs) Yeah, one and done. One and done, right? Yeah. So tell us about Nicole. What did I miss? What? Who are you? Where you come from? Where do you hail from? I'm originally from Rochester, Minnesota. I currently live in Wisconsin. I kind of have toured the Midwest over the years and finally set down some roots after traveling for my husband's medical residency and training. So always been a Midwestern girl. And my brother, who I do Total Potential with, same thing, <laughs> here in the Midwest and raising our families and been wonderful. 
Yeah, I, I didn't uh, I didn't mention that. So Cole Cole works with her brother Jake, who is a former professional hockey player. Now he probably gets tired of hearing that, right? You know, sometimes maybe I don't know. There's he worked so hard for so long to yeah. get there that I think there's some yeah. of it where it's like, okay, maybe that was worth it. <laughs> okay. But he still lives in that world. He still coaches high school hockey and his son's hockey team and all that stuff. So it's still a big part of his life. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a hockey fan, but I, we, we don't need to talk about hockey because my brother-in-law's team is winning after the <laughs> brother-in-law team won the Super Bowl. And there's the Tom Brady thing and there's the repeat of the lightning winning and i hate <laughs> hockey right now I'll be honest with you it's terrible <laughs> love you eric i'm happy for you buddy but dude man nobody should have that much glee you right. know it's too much <laughs> for a sports fan to handle but anyway they work together uh, as siblings on a mission to maximize growth and cultivate wellness and families everywhere uh, a forthcoming book the total potential is going to help families thrive in body mind spirit and mostly importantly in connection with one another. I think that's that's really a cool endeavor. Yeah, you know, it, this whole thing started between us as a round and round conversation. We kept having this conversation where we were both seeking developmental opportunities and paths. Like, okay, we checked a lot of the boxes. We got the spouse, we got the kids, we have the house, we have the job. Like, this doesn't feel quite like we were expecting. And <clears throat> so we were both on these paths of really trying to carve out, you know, what the next best steps were. And we kept coming into the same conversation of, okay, well, great. We can meal prep on the weekend, but then my kids don't eat that. <laughs> and now I'm cooking two meals instead of one. Like, eh, that's not going to happen. It or great. I can, yeah. I can spend three hours in the gym, but okay, wonderful. Now I'm three hours more away from my family. So we just kept having this round and round conversation we're like, there has, to, there is a way to do this. There has to be a way to do this. Like we're going to, dive in deep and figure it out <laughs> nice yeah T together as siblings yeah now, and, and he has a family as well his own or yep he's married with two kids and yeah his own family a it is a rat race too. you know it is it there can feel like a hamster wheel really quickly and that's what we don't want it to feel like we want the days to feel intentional and like they're happening on purpose so and, you know, it's it's awesome that you point that out. You know, what you just triggered my brain to do is the realness of it, right? Like, I've kind of maintained, and you go by Cole, right? Not Nicole, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah I've kind of maintained, Cole, that, like, do, people that don't have kids struggle with the understanding. Like, I, I feel like it's one of the biggest before and after life events that a person has in their life cycle, but, right? Absolutely. I mean, it just, it's the biggest almost that you can't identify if, if you don't. And I know, I know kid people that don't have kids balk at that, but I, but I, I do, I kind of stand by that. And, you know, prior to getting into this, you're kind of like, Oh yes, I'm, I'm curious as a dietitian, right? Like we're going to have vegetables. We're going to have a well-rounded diet. We're going to go. And then the kids like chicken nuggets, mom, that's it. Yeah. That's what I got. Mac <laughs> yeah. and cheese, please. Well, because you know, the world works in mysterious ways. I was working as a pediatric dietitian. I started that job when my son was two. And he was always kind of a picky eater, but around that time, as I gained more knowledge and understanding of like actually setting up that, you know, food relationship and the food environment for a young child, I was like, there is something else going on here. Turns out my oldest son had a sensory disorder that co oh. completely affected his right. ability to try new foods and have all. And so I'm like, that would happen. You're a pediatric dietitian and you have like the pickiest <laughs> eater ever <laughs> right. for a child. Like that's just how it goes. So it, isn't yeah. that something, right? Yeah. It, it's funny. I, I, we need to do another show. Maybe, you know, Neil's here with us behind me. We need to make a note. I, I recently came across, oh gosh, man, a dynamic find in a therapy relationship with somebody that I've been in therapy with for a long time. And we identified the sensory issues. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Chris, like, dude, you don't understand. Like, this has defined m my whole life in a lot of ways. And I, and I myself was kind of like, wow, you know, I, I had no idea that it could be that profound. And, and it was, he, it had him believing me all, all sorts of things about himself that, that weren't, that weren't true. So that's a, that's a dynamic issue in and of itself, the sensory issues. Yeah. 
Well, and it, to kind of go to like the topic that we're talking about today, you know, it really, it was my first parenting moment where I really had to make a decision that was not what I was supposed to do. You right. know, even the people in our family were like, he's fine. He'll be fine. Sure. And after like three years of therapy, he of occupational therapy, was he fine? Yes, he was. But because we did the work. And so that was the first time where it was really like, well, I have to set up the environment that makes the most sense for us so that we can optimally function together because this other version, it's not working for us in any way. So it was a big parenting learn. <laughs> Every child is unique. Every family is unique. Every person really has certain circumstances that you might not have expected or understood prior. And wow, right off the gate, we have a teaching moment in the sense of like, realize that, you know, what works for the world might not work for you, right? Yeah. And to trust your instincts on that too, right? It's like, I knew right. there was something else, even right. though I had all these inputs that no, no, it's not, it's not. Even the pediatrician, it's not, he's fine. You know, everybody, it's like, my mom gut is telling me something else is going on here. I have to follow it. And, you know, that's significant because my wife works in the tr CDSA, the Child Services and Developmentally, De Developmentally Delayed Folks, um, CDSA, what's that stand for? doesn't matter. She works for, for, for kids zero to age three. And often they're identifying, you know, profound disabilities and things that parents are struggling to just, as you say, Boy, how about that for another out right out the gate teaching moment? Trust your gut, man. I mean, that's that's something that I don't think because you're you're new parent. You don't know what's going yes. on. You don't particularly if it's your 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 first child, right? Like you don't know what to expect and how to go about identifying those things like a sensory uh, issue. So that that's cool. Yeah. 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 Okay. We, in way of introduction, we, we went on a little journey there and that's cool. Uh, so you, I, I, I would say that, you know, you, you, you like it cold up there in Minnesota, but you guys got a heat wave going on. We have had a little bit of a heat wave, but Holy it's kind of pleasant because we're so used to the cold that we're like, yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah, but I'm here in 102 degrees in Seattle, Washington, kind of hot. Like what is Yeah, up? it hasn't been quite that bad here in Wisconsin, but yeah, our heat wave has, it's been a little bit warmer than usual for sure. Right. What do you like to do for fun? I love to do yoga. <laughs> which yeah. is why I became a yoga teacher. I love to be outside and in nature. I love to cook. I love to just hang with my family, play board games, like real silly stuff. But that's my, that's my jam. So you know what Parcheesi is? I don't. You don't know what Parcheesi is? No. Oh man, it's the world's best. Well, maybe not the best, but it's a, it's an awesome board game. Now everyone's going to oh, like cool. Google. What's Parcheesi? Yeah, yeah, now I'm going to have to look it up. <laughs> I love it. So you have a, uh, the book release date is actually, is it, is it a solid October the 12th? I think it's going to be October the 12th, October yeah. for sure. Okay. You guys like what you hear from Ms. Birchbeck. You need to check out the, the, the work total potential. It's going to have a lot of this kind of stuff in it, I guess, as far as, you know, a family environment. And I think that you mix in a lot of the unbeatable mind, which we all know from Mr. Craig Graves, who's been peppering in for the last year to his unbeatable mind components. So is yeah. that, is that what total potential, you know, draws from primarily or from I wouldn't say necessarily primarily, but okay. the cool thing about unbeatable mind, that's a big overlap with our upcoming book are things like building awareness. Like how do I even start to become aware of the patterns that are driving my life and driving the choices I make in my marriage and as a parent so that I can make choices that I actually intended to make, not just the ones mm -hmm. I have been conditioned to make. Using breath work and meditation and some of the practices that build awareness, like those, those are some overlaps between Unbeatable Mind and our book. A little bit of uniqueness with the book though, you know, we really wanted to draw on what are the aspects of traditions from around the world that have these little nuggets that completely overlap and those are like the nuggets of truth and wisdom, right? So things like, contentment. How do you build contentment in your family when you're in a pattern where you're trying <laughs> awesome. to grow growth? You know, like you can find contentment in every tradition on the planet from religions, Eastern traditions, like you name it. But we, you know, we get segment those things off. And so we've hmm. just said, well, what are the commonalities that are useful to us as we create a healthy and, you know, thriving family environment? So there's, there's some of the unbeatable mind components present for sure, but some other polls as well. 
I like how you build, you, you know, you're pulling things together. That's, that's, that's totally cool. And I'm, I'm totally laughing inside myself because right, right from the beginning of our platform, like I pulled a few different things that were particular and specific, you know, to start and, and, and episode one was, was founded a little bit on what I call the cornerstone of mental health, self-care. But you know what episode two literally was about? Contentment. <laughs> yes. The, it, I think it was titled the elusive goal of, con the elusive, what, what did I call it? The elusive goal of contentment, I think is what it is. And, That's and why how it's you've... the final chapter of our book. Because <laughs> it takes some work to it. get there. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely love it. Neil, let me pull you in here for a minute, man. We, we wanted to kind of go, so we're going to jump out and then jump back into the parenting thing. Because Nicole, on our show, we, we really stay tuned in to, you know, the current events and things that are going on all around us. One of the things I love the show, I mean, the things we talk about are applicable. And, you you know, if you pay attention, I mean, you'll see them, you know, constantly in and around what we've got going on. So I've got a quick current event I want to spend a minute on. Neil, you with us, man? I am here. There we go. So in episode 29 and episode 30, we did, Nicole, a, a, a spot on the whole national opioid epidemic. It was, oh, my gosh, crazy, and and all that went on with that. And so, really, if you're interested in that issue, you really need to tune in to that to those shows because we covered it really nicely. And, and I learned a lot doing those shows and looking at the story. Well, don't you know, Neil, J&J &J settles New York opioid claim for 230 fast cash million, right? Did you, did you catch this story at all, Neil? I had not seen this one yet. Yeah, and and actually, that was before you when you were a part of our show, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I thought yeah, by by far. So you may not have have listened to it, but and and Cole, do you chime in? But I was I was kind of amazed at one of the the outcomes, and I'm curious what you guys see in this. Of course, everyone knows the opioid epidemic was the you know the phenomena that you know these drug companies created these pain medications that you know were purported to be non-addictive, were purported to be basic, you know, medications to use for, for pain management. And, you know, it's like, oh, don't worry about this. It's not a big deal. You just prescribe these things. It's like, you know, it's like candy. And there was a quote that one of the drug company representatives was caught and recorded as saying that, hey, we can just keep on producing these things. These people keep on eating them like Doritos. This is great. This is great bottom line for us. I mean, can you, is that not terrible? It's awful. Right? It's awful. And so this settlement, the big highlight that I saw, I'm curious about your all's, both of y'all's take, and then we'll move on with some of the parenting. They permanently agreed to end production and manufacturing of opioids. And, of course, the agreement did not remove them. Oh, and the agreement removed them from a suit that's about to kick off in, I think it's in New York, but with all, a lot of the other drug companies. So stay tuned because, you know, the drug companies are being held to task and their statement included that they did not engage in any wrongdoing. Of course, they're going to make that, that statement. And, you know, however you feel about that, I don't know, but I was kind of amazed guys at a drug company making an agreement that they are no longer going to produce manufacture or uh, market the use of opioids. Like, I just find that like amazing. What, what says, what says y'all? The first thing that comes to mind is, does that mean people are going to stop calling my husband in the middle of the night because he's a, he's an orthopedic surgeon. And so they are at the brunt of a lot of the drug requests, but I mean, he makes patients sign agreements for how much op opioids, like it's a huge problem, a huge problem. So it's really interesting to me, like, they don't currently have a ton of substitutions for pain management for like post, you know, right. operations and stuff. Like, how do you just end it? I mean, I can see why they would want, it is a crisis in this country, but it's, it's an interesting swing to it, a completely different space. Isn't it though? J and J is out of the game. So Straight interesting. up. Right. I don't know what that's bringing. Neil, what's your, what's your kind of take? Are, are you as, are you as shocked or surprised as, as I feel, I'm very shocked by the stopping the production. Like I can see a lot of changes in how it's being managed or the different pieces of it. But the fact that they stopped production and making it, I'm kind of concerned about the people that are hooked and how do you get them off of that thing and how do you transition or like Cole said, what other options are there? You know, it seemed like opioids were like the next step from morphine, which had all of its issues from before. So now the question is, is what can we do? You know, is, wow, it, is right. it an opioid issue with the chemicals or is it a, a mental health issue with dealing with the addiction of the effect that the opioids cause? And now does that mean there's going to be more 
treatment, mental health treatment for that side of it to help wean people off so there's less opioid dependency. Boy. I don't know, but that's that's the I'm with Cole. What are you going to use in case of these situations where you have that guy who scoped his knee and he's in excruciating he's in real excruciating pain and he needs something to help get him through the therapies and get him through the recovery. So it is a tough, tough issue for for mental health and for substance abuse therapists. Honestly, I mean, I've dealt with a chronic pain. We can go down a rabbit hole with that for quite a while. Neil, you bring up an excellent point. I mean, what does this, you know, play out for as far as treatment? And you know, I mean, if like all of them just stopped producing and everything, I guess you got no more opioids. Well, you, you know, now you go to the border and you get a whole lot more fentanyl coming in. We already see those issues. Yeah, I, it's crazy. I don't know that we're going to resolve all that today, but I definitely wanted to bring that up because I think that's big news. You know, I think that's that's a pretty big current event for really for our nation, for everyone across our land. So let's get back to what we're talking about with the parenting thing. I, I feel compelled, you know, to to bring up the the issue of and and cure. I'm dying, Cole, to see what you what you take from what I think is the creme de la creme when it comes to the the parenting issues that we have and the confusion, as you said, trust your gut. There, there are so much inundation. That's a cool word, right? Yeah. Inundation of information and this is what you should do. And that's what you should do. And all the other, you know, opinionated parent shaming realities that come across. I have found something called love and logic. And I, it's my, whenever I talk about parenting, I'm pretty much going to mention it and drive my audience crazy because I feel that strongly that it is that great of an approach in dealing with kids. You ever hear of it? Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Ah. Tell me what you know about it. One of my favorite ideas is just the natural consequences. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. In life, things have consequences, no matter if you're two or 55, like that's, you know, that's part of it. I think there's an element that that resource provides around creating an environment for patients because it right. does give you so many, you know, tools and just very like clear steps of actions to take that really empower a person as a parent, which when you feel like you know what to do, that is a helpful way to keep calm and patient and, you know, other things that really benefit the environment for our kids. Is there such thing as a patient parent? <laughs> I'm feeling convicted. I'm I'm feeling the world is looking at me. <laughs> we used to laugh. My brother used to always say, like, you are like a duck. He's like, you're so cool on the outside. And just like the way you then share what's going on. I just know you're <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. It it is such a challenge. And and that's one of the things that you, you do. I mean, you, you feel convicted and, and bad. Like I am not, I don't feel like a patient parent, but, but it is, you know, real quick, uh, we've done a whole show on love and logic before Craig struggled with the first sentence, but here's the, here's the main progression just to wet your whistle and get you to thinking and, and go check out the show that we did spend a lot of time going through this, what I feel as a part of the trifecta in mental health, the three cool things that I've come across. One is EFT for marriage. And we'll talk about that on yeah, your show, I think. Yeah. <laughs> right. The second is Dave Ramsey's financial piece. I think that is absolutely the bomb, actually, for couples and and working together with finances and financial realities. And the third is love and logic with with parenting. Uh, the, these three uh, philosophies that are whole wrap around views about how to deal with those issues are the bomb. So here it is. Love and logic kind of goes, kid, kiddo, you could do anything that you want to do, right? As long as you don't cause a problem for somebody else, right? Uh oh. If you cause a problem for somebody else, you better fix that problem. And of course, the parent job kicks in. Ah, little Johnny, I see that you haven't fixed that problem. Kid's probably going to be like, well, that's not a problem, Dad. That's no problem. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. But don't worry about it. No no problem there. We'll come through and we'll, we'll take care of that problem. And then you come around in on the back end, and that's when your high structure environment gets created where you're empowered and you're teaching life lessons through natural consequences in a lot of ways where you hold the kid responsible so that the kid picks up the candy wrappers because he's holding the he's causing the problem even though he doesn't see it and that's where we get the challenge of creating all kinds of creative things on the back end to create that structure and that's where people tend to struggle the most so that's the basic underpinnings of love love and logic does that sound familiar 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's so interesting because as you said, the opportunity for the teachable moments. And that is something that I just like in all of parenting, you know, our, even like the word discipline, it doesn't mean like put your kid in the corner, right? Like it means to teach. That's the root of the word comes from teaching. And so I just love highlighting that point that right. you know, discipline with our children is an opportunity to help them learn. That's the, that's the big job. <laughs> kind of what we're doing. Yeah. That's yeah. ultimately what we're doing. And you grow the most when you hurt the most. I mean, you know, little Johnny and, and little Jane have got to skin their knee. You know, it, it's, yeah. that's hard to watch. Yeah. And that's a really interesting point at this current moment in parenting, because of like what you said before, there's all these things about what you should do and how it must be and creating this like perfect bubble environment for our kids. A social worker I used to work with said the best parents are good enough. Like your kid needs mm. discomfort sometimes because that's the only way that they grow. Like if ev nothing ever hurts, nothing's ever uncomfortable, like stand by. Cause at some point in your life, <laughs> things are going to get uncomfortable. And if you have no skills developed for that, then what? I've often thought we need to start selling some merchandise. I think I have ideas all over the place. <laughs> and Nicole, that would be on a t-shirt. The, the best, best parents, parents are good, are enough. good enough. Yes. <laughs> yep. Neil, that's a takeaway right there, buddy. Write that one down because I, I will also throw out, you know, my, th that triggers my thought that I've kind of said thousands of times. I really believe that the parents are doing the best that they know how to do with what they have to offer. Yes. That, almost across the board, you know. Even like your worst parents, whatever that even means, you know, people can get all judgy. You're really trying to do the best that you know how to do with what you have to offer. And if and and I love, I, I may add that to my my quote and, and steal it from you if you're okay with it, because the follow up to that is parents just need to be, you know, they're good enough. That's the best parenting. That's that's awesome. Yeah, and luckily I heard that really when I had young kids. Yeah, <laughs> so I appreciated yeah. knowing that advice early on. <laughs> Because I've heard it said when, when the kids get bigger, so do the problems. Yeah, that's and my mom always said that, yep. I can attest to that having a 19 and 16-year-old. <laughs> OMG, I'll leave it off right there. That's enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it is we it is it is so true. I mean, you know, the, the and the emotions get bigger. You know, they're yes. dealing with drugs and driving and, you know, dating and, and you know, figuring out their the progression of their own life. I mean, you know their own life, there's a lot of things that begin to kick off. And I think that part of what we're going to talk about today as we go through are, are the real strategies, the real things that really can apply to the relationship between you and your child and your whole family system. That's a, that's, it is. It's a lot to tackle. Um, yeah. but, but to think about it in that context, right? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I always think that whenever you're thinking about creating the environment or coming in relationship with anybody, but especially with your family, because those, you know, hopefully are the people we care the most about. Like if we don't take care of home base, like watch out, like things are not going to be, you know, the translation of that is going to show up somewhere in the family. And so whenever I think about creating that environment and creating that system, like you got to make sure that system's in place for home base too, not just that your kids are experiencing, you know, physical movement, for instance, or a healthy diet. Like those things need, if that's what you want as part of your family environment, like it's got to start at home base too. So, and I think as I can't speak for being a dad, I'm not a dad, but as a mom, like we are conditioned to give of ourselves until the very last drop and hmm. it's wow right yeah and then wow we wonder why we're drained and we don't sleep well and we're irritable and and if i can't take care of home base i have nothing left to give anyone else there's no there's nothing in the cup <laughs> it's empty right. you know and and we have a youtube video now and i think this is going to be out on youtube our second one if all goes well and so you know the the listening audience on a podcast can't see the home base what Nicole did is she's got both hands, right? Pointing at self. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you said that, what that, what that led me to, to realize or, or think about is, you know, good to the last drop. You ever hear that phrase? Yes. Right. <laughs> Maxwell house, good to the last 
drop. Yeah. That's not good when you're talking about a relationship with your kids. Right. Like my last drop actually isn't good. <laughs> I'm not I'm not good on my last drop. Very, very bad. Right. Right. Not a patient moment is what I'm picking up on with no. the last drop. Yeah. yeah, you can't do that. And and you know, I, the cornerstone of mental health, I've say thousands of times over, is self care. I mean, you've got to have, you know, you, you mentioned movement and exercise and nutrition. And, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but when my kids were like four or five years old, man. I'm grabbing the leftover chicken nuggets and a little bit of, you know, the, the hamburger that's half eaten. Yes, the half eaten hamburger is my meal. <laughs> yes. know, honestly, because that's yeah. what you get into that. And and I'm I made a lot of mistakes in that in that way. You can interpret that as a as a mistake. I do, you know. Well, again, we're doing the best with what we have, right? And so there are the, like, I will never forget. It was a real blessing for both my brother and I that we were athletes in our younger years because then we got into adulthood and we're no longer athletes. <laughs> and very quickly, <laughs> right? like, that sensation of what it felt like to not be well in our bodies, we felt that really, really quickly. And so when my kids were little, I mean, was I doing the workouts I am now? Absolutely not. But I was doing push-ups on the bath on the side of the bathtub and I was doing squats while they were, you know, getting changed in their bedroom. Like just right. doing little things yeah. so that I could still have those moments of self-care, even though I don't have an hour to commit, you know, to going to the gym or whatever it might be. Right. Right. No, absolutely. And I, and I'll tell you, you know, it, it really is a challenge there because, you know, what I'm thinking about, I, I have a, a couple of friends that have a situation, you know, you start approaching midlife and, and you have the oopsie, you know, and mm -hmm. here comes the third kid or you're having your first kid. Like people are waiting a long time to have children now. They're like 35, 34 years old before they have their their first child. And there's a lot of advantages to that. It's not a good or bad reality, but it is a reality. And so we're talking about your midlife body at 45, 50 years old, trying to kind of be in a tent at Cub Scouts. Sorry, I'm projecting there a lot because <laughs> OMG, if I never am in a tent again, I am going to be well, right? Yes. <laughs> but you're, you're, that's a challenge to manage those, those body changes and exercise and nutrition, you know, while you're trying to do the best by your kids. Yeah. And that's why taking care of home base is so important, even if it's in small little ways every day. And that's another thing we talk about in the book. It's like, it's, it's not the, you know, three hour once a week CrossFit workout that's going to do the trick. It's the like small daily, like I move my body in a simple way every day. That's where you get some real trajectory for like feeling well in this body you know, day in and day out and not just like crushing it once a week or, you know, whatever it might be. So, well, you know, and that that's that's also realistic, Cole, because, you know, there's a lot of people that let's face it. I mean, you know, it's one, one of the things I hate about exercise. Right. Like I am I'm starting to hike and walk a little bit more now. Well, I was hiking and walking like a crap ton maybe a couple of years ago and it felt great. And I kind of stopped. Dude, I just went literally to a park yesterday after work and I got on some trails and it was, it was good. I actually got lost because the trails have gotten a little <laughs> bit overgrown and I took off trail and I'm like, where, what the heck I had to, anyway, I was done. I was like, well, dude, I would walk this before and think nothing of it. Mm -hmm. So the very realistic part that you're talking about there is start small, you know, just begin, you know, if it's, if it's 10 jumping jacks, when's the last time you done jumping jacks? Because dude, they're hard. <laughs> They're hard. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they're not really made for like postpartum life so much, but yeah, they're, <laughs> they're interesting. <laughs> the women out there are loving you right now. <laughs> You're right there. What is that? Jumping jacks are not made for postpartum. I, I think yeah. that's, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> That can be so, t-shirt number two. <laughs> t-shirt number two, absolutely. So uh, I wanted to mention the word codependency in this conversation. So let's do a little quick little segment on codependency. It's actually a full chapter in my book on, 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 you know, becoming your best self, right? Because on, on the surface, it's a concept and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but it's a concept that was born in the substance abuse field. It was a codependent wife or husband to a spouse who has addiction. And the basic premise with the clinical kind of issue, though, it's not a diagnosis. I see it as a clinic, you know, a clinical issue. You, you kind of become what the other person is. So if the other person is well, then you're well. If the other person's not well, 
then you're not well. So your behavior, your energy is derived at making sure the other person is well so that you'll be well. That's, that's the fundamental nature of, of codependency. And so I maintain that what I've learned and seen over the many years of doing therapy with people, that parenting on a, on a fundamental level has elements, if not full-blown codependency on the child. And that's dangerous. You ever hear codependency? What says you? Yes. Well, the thing that's coming to mind is, you know, in early years, there's not that differentiation between parent and self for the child, right? Like they only know the connection of their caregiver. And so that's the first thing that comes to mind. It's like the behaviors, the temperament, the language, like all those things that are present in the environment, like there's like almost like a direct (laughs) transmission to the child, right? And that becomes their subconscious programming that they then have until they're old enough or have something happen where they need to finally pay attention to their wow. subconscious programming. So mm-hmm. that's the first thing that comes to mind. Like we're modeling every single thing that at some point is possible to see again in our children. Neil, who knew that this guest had deep psychological understanding that a doctor in psychology would be talking about, man, that rocks right there. Cole. I got to give you props. Well done. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, we may need to replay that back a few times because I think you nailed it. I mean, it's, there's a lot going on in that parent child connection in that, you know, I hear you talking about relationship a lot. Let, let, let me go off script and ask you, you know, when, when we're talking about, you know, a healthy family environment in parenting, how much does that revolve around, the different relationships that, that are, that are forged, that are created in, in social work, which is my underpinning of, 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 of training and whatnot. We talk about systems theory, which Mm -hmm. which has to do with the, the, the the individual person as a system inside the, the immediate family as a system inside of the cultural extended family, and then the community and the country and the world, like systems and how they all interact with each other. There's a lot, I hear you talking about relationship a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the relationship starts with yourself, right? Like, are you connected to yourself? Do you understand yourself? Do you, do you have a deep connection, like internally to what your body tells you, what your thoughts are like that relationship? That's a, you know, that's a whole lifetime of work right there. And then I think of, okay, so then that self, wherever that self currently is, goes into relationship into the marriage and that person brings their own, you know, set of dynamics. And I really like marriage and family to me, the reason it's so, such a really profound area to commit to this growth work is because of the way, the dynamics of these relationships, because they're always, always changing and new things are showing up all of the time. And so those relationships are not only individual, like you're saying, like me and my one son have a very different relationship than me and my other son, even though we can all laugh at the same jokes and, you know, (laughs) things like that. But I think if you're super, my experience has been that when I was really out of touch with myself, it was much, much harder to be in like true real relationship with anyone in my house, let alone anyone past that. Boy, that's a big statement. Say, say that again. If you're not in relationship with yourself, it's really hard to be in a contact relationship with others. Yeah, absolutely. Cause it's not that the relationship is not true, right? It's, it's almost like you're living a script when you're not super connected to your own being it's like the things you say to people, it's like not even your words, the way you respond to them. It's not even your response. It's not your behavior. It's just like the thing you're supposed to be doing. Speak so, it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And it's, you know, we're operating out of our subconscious programming like 90% of the time. So like it takes some real thought and work to, oh, wow, I actually do do that. And now I'm conscious of it. And now I can make a choice around it. So it's, I'm not trying to say that, you know, somebody who feels out of touch with themselves is somehow in the wrong, like, no, it's made it's, that way. <laughs> exactly. And, and, I, and I don't want the audience, I don't want any, everyone listening to think like, you know, wow, this is overwhelming. You mean I had to like know my inner self and whatever? <laughs> no, you, you, you have to try and, and begin building that relationship with yourself so that your relationship with your parents or your kids can, 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 can foster and grow because it is, I love what you say. It's always 
It's always changing. And I think there's another big statement that you just made, you know, 90% of the time, I think that's an arbitrary number, but it might not be too far off of the truth. Yeah. Yeah. 90% of the time we're working from our subconscious self, yeah. uh, you know, in the programming and the, sometimes that's not such a great script. Yeah. And even when the script is decent, it's still not yours. Right. That's the thing my brother and I have really noticed so often is we were raised by like wonderful, loving parents, but we are not them. Right. Right. Like, so, so the, the ways that they and, and, and worked, he's not you. Right. The, and so even coming closer to understanding like, oh, that's really interesting. My mom loved us in that very particular way. And it was her way of loving, but that doesn't actually feel like how I feel when I want to be loving. So, you know, just having the awareness of what's actually true to me as a person even if your script was awesome, like that's still yeah, work. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I like the genuineness that you're, that you're showing and I, I will follow you in that and say, you know, it is really hard to know thine self as mm-hmm. they say, right? Because you are always changing. And I don't know about you, but I'm a, I'm a therapist, right? Like I do this for a living. Do you think I'm aware of my feelings and emotions like all the time? Come on. I'm just trying to get through the day so I could see the Pittsburgh Penguins play another game. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not, I'm not evaluating. And, and, and you, and if you're not staying on top of that, then you, you kind of, you lose it easily. It's like exercise. It's a, isn't it? It's a maintaining uh, of these, of these things to have a healthy environment. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Let's, let's go through some, some quick hitters with, with some things that, that you were bringing uh, to the table and then, and then we'll do some quick hitters with, with some interesting questions that I was bringing to the table. Bust the myth that good parents sacrifice themselves for their children. Yeah, actually, I think we talked about that. You know, good parents take care of themselves in mind, body, spirit, and doing so their children, you know, teaching them, you know, how do they do the same? I think that's the good to the last drop. Yes. Comment, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm never going to forget. We are trained because, you know, dad, by the way, dads are taught that too, right? Yeah. We, we, we will work ourselves to the bone. We are taught from a very early age in a similar way that you got to put your nose to the grindstone and work your knuckles in. And yeah. it's, it's, you got, you know, you do that repetitively. You got nothing left. Right. Right. So, so we kind of covered that one. We're, we are modeling behavior that will inevitably be repeated in our children, I think is absolutely a quote from you that is just true, but that we have the opportunity to choose practices, mindsets, and connections that grow the whole family. How, how does your coaching kind of, you know, tone to that? Yeah, in a lot of ways, because I think it's really easy to set purposeful and meaningful goals around what you want your relationships and your family life to be like. And so coaching is something that's a cool place to address that. Other mindset pieces come to mind, like creating a mindset of positivity, right? Like how, what's the language like in your house? I'm hearing Craig right here with feed the courage wolf. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's true though. And I will say, especially in parenting, we want so desperately from like the center of our being to be good parents. And I think we, it's really easy to operate out of fear in that because you just don't want to mess up. Like you love these people so much. I do not want to do wrong by you to, you know, for anything. And so I think it's, it's even harder, I think, to be a really courageous parent yeah. And what that looks like, even then, even harder than it is to be courageous, maybe at work or during a workout or, you know, other areas where there's less at stake. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. I was just thinking how I was going to address this next little piece. And mm-hmm. it, this is totally unfair to do to you. But Cole, you seem friendly. You seem like you're not going to get mad at me. So I'm going to take a shot at it. OK. <laughs> you ready for this? <laughs> I think <laughs> it's, it's like an impossible question to, to incorporate into this whole conversation. But I, and, but we did. We talked about the, the physical movement and taking care of yourself. And and the, it, it, so we get to the dietary question. I mean, you know, I, I realize we could do a whole show on this, but using your dietary training and the realities that we hear with all this, again, I'm going to use the word inundation of material, of information and, you know, and judgment about, you know, nutrition. 
Can, can we spend a moment on really kind of thinking about that? Like, you know, uh, pregnant moms are terrified about, to have, I, have I taken enough folic acid? Have I done an, done an you know, in utero exercise? Am, am I doing my baby wrong? I mean, it's terrifying, I would imagine. Not just for a first mom, but for your second and third child. It's terrifying because that's an awesome response. I mean, the child is like in you, right? Yeah. So can you speak a little bit to your expertise with the dietary factors? Yeah, for me with the realm of diet, the biggest factor ends up being like, what is our relationship to food and what is our food environment? So when I'm thinking about with my kids, even more so the food environment, like, is it a happy time to come sit down at dinner together? Or is it like a storm, right? Like, wow that would suck to come sit at dinner in a storm every night or with somebody who's got a terrible attitude or whatever. Are the kids invited into the kitchen? Are they invited to help prepare food or go grocery shopping or decide what's going to be part of like a family tradition meal or a big celebration? You know, there's a lot of ways to create a ton of positivity around food especially with the kids where it's not about, did you eat your vegetables? Did you, you know, no cookies Love after it. dinner? Love it. Yeah. yeah. Cause those nuances, honestly, like we're all working on those over the course of our life. Like what I eat now as a about to be 40 year old is very different than when I ate as a 25 year old, even though as I was a dietitian at both points, right? Like <laughs> my body's right. changing, my body responds differently to certain things. Like the nuances of the individual foods, it's super cool. It's fascinating. But as far as like setting our kids up for success, like that food environment is just, it's a moneymaker for sure. A moneymaker, you know, it, it's, it's funny because if I I like to sort of just, you know, through a therapist's eyes, the concept of the show, right. When I'm, when I'm talking about weight loss or body image, you know, therapy issues that kind of come up around this and my own travels and journeys, you just surprised me for the second time. And, and, (laughs) and and what I mean by that is when we talked about this off mic, you know, you'd think I would have anticipated that, but you just surprised me again, because where even when I was asking that question, what my mind goes to is what everyone talks about. You know, do you take your multivitamins? Do you have your food groups addressed? Do you, you know, do you have enough vegetables? Stop eating the snacks. Deal with, you know, your 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 calorie counting. And oh God, it's 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 terrifying. It's overwhelming. And it's it's, so it's just overwhelming. Mu- <laughs> it, it's ter- it's just it yeah it's awful yeah. what we do to ourselves and what you're talking about instead of all that crap just look at your relationship yeah with food your relationship with yourself the 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 opportunities that are there for family activities you know i i tell you you know what just popped in my mind you know one of the best in-home family therapy activities that i created when i was in home with a with an with a difficult child and the single mom and the younger brother was there I brought pizza, the different ingredients. And I learned this actually from somebody and I did it because he was, he was brilliant with that. And we chopped up the onions and chopped up the green peppers and everybody got to decide what's on their little individual pizza. And we put the cheese on there and it was made together. And then we ate it together and it was amazing therapeutic intervention. Yeah. And that's available to us every day, you know, like, I mean, not every day. I know family life is also busy life, but like that's very available. And even if it's just a snack or something small or breakfast on Sunday morning, like there's just, there's so many opportunities to like show love in that way and have meals and together time be an expression of like the goodness rather than, you know, the place where we pick people apart or why didn't you do this? Why do you do that? Because then So as I think about that young age food environment, think of the lessons we carry forward from that. Like if we got rewarded with food, guess what you're going to do as an adult? You're going to reward yourself with food and the rewards then are in your control. So it's like there's so many little lessons that are learned as children in a really positive, nurturing food environment that help with that long-term health perspective as we grow. And, you know, I just want to comment, right? Like this can be overwhelming. You're doing the best that you can do with what you have to offer. 
and all we're talking about is just add a little piece. Yeah. And, and if and if all it is is let's change the idea that we we reward ourselves with an extra snack or something. Let's kind of re reimagine that because I literally just did that yesterday, Nicole. <laughs> Cole, I did this yesterday. Okay. Oh my gosh! To this day, when I get stressed, <laughs> the first thought is like, "Where's the chocolate?" And I'm like, "My mom." Hello, she's right here with me. She loved her chocolate. That's how we managed stress when we were little. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah what's it's in there, isn't it? It's yeah. baked in there. Forgive <laughs> the pun, but it's yeah. baked into the way that we operate and the relationship with ourselves. So it's just becoming aware of these things. That's all. Yes. Becoming aware of it. Decide if you want to keep it. Decide if you want to change it. You know, or lose. I say that to clients all together all the time, particularly in marriage, right? Like, what are the patterns? You want to keep them? Fine. Yeah. Do you want to just, just tweak having them? the choice? Right. You're empowered. Right. How about that for a word? You're yeah. empowered. OK, let's let's journey through a few years. Right. Let me pop you with a question. How do you handle such dramatic things that teens do? Right. You said <laughs> when the kids get bigger, the problems get bigger. Yeah. So we're talking about like legal issues, stealing things. That's sometimes a kid issue too, a little guy, you know, running away, substance abuse. How do we handle those heavy hitters, says Cole? You know, I'm not sure I'm an expert on this, but what I do know is that the more open the communication is and the more honest and open the lines of communication are and the more regularly they're available, the better, regardless of the circumstance. The other thing I think that I'm noticing, so my oldest is 14. And so we're just on the cusp of, you know, life with teens, right? Buckle, buckle up, Cole. Buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> but little things I'm noticing that, just the fact that he knows that I'm honest and I care about him and I'm available to him sets up a relationship of, tr of trust between us that he knows whatever he comes to me with, like, it's all going to be okay. We're, we'll figure it out regardless of what it is. The other thing is that I think as kids get bigger, I notice that distance of like the physical distance and the communication distance. And it's like the closer we can bridge that gap. I mean, I, I'm i dreading the day where he doesn't want to hug me before he goes to school every day. Right. But if he doesn't want to hug me, guess what? He's getting a high five. He's getting a pat on the back. He's right. getting something right. because we can't right. lose that touch. It's got to be there, but it changes. Yes. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm impressed with that, Cole, because that's, that's one of the things that I really, really picked up on. That I think when I went to that love and logic and my, my older was getting into my older was probably where where your oldest is now. And that was one of the 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 bites that 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 bought in to my head and burrowed its way in. And I'm glad because it's still tough, though. But, mm -hmm. you know, teenagers do not want physical touch. They rebuke it. I mean, it's a joke now in my family. I'll go to my 19 year old buddy. You need a hug or whatever, you know. <laughs> Don't you know, my my 16 year old let me hug him the other day. I was so happy. I was like, oh, my God, yes. that's amazing. Yes. But but what happens is they're they're testing and 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 there's a love relationship there and when you stop touching and stop doing that they don't realize it but they're interpreting oh, you don't love me anymore. Yeah. You you used to cuddle with me, you used to whatever and well, I know I, I don't want I push away, but there's a there's a there's a lot there. I just wanted to highlight that. And the yeah. love and logic people talk a lot about relationship as well and and that 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 touching is is very I mean human touch is amazing powerfully isn't it Yeah absolutely it's and in the family it's like a secret weapon i think because it Ooh. bonds us so quickly right like even just reaching out holding hands for a minute giving a hug giving a high five it is like oh we're back together You're going to love this mental note here in the end in about 10 minutes you're going to laugh when we do what i do with guests just okay. mental note and it's going to come back to you uh, okay. just remember high five and physical touch so okay blended families it's another big area that i deal with and uh, you know i don't know if we've done i've mentioned a few times blended families like if we've done a lot on that I, I, i'm going to make a note to, to to really look at that because because that's that's a topic that isn't talked about much you know when you when you bring steps in and you know, step parenting and multiple adults in that kid's life. Hold me to that, Neil. We really need to be talking about that more because I don't know that, you know, have, have you incorporated that into the type of relationship that that is? 
we haven't personally spent a lot of time digging into that, but the first thing that comes to mind is some of the elements that make all teams work well, which I almost think of that environment as like, you know, we're blending, right? We're blending maybe people that didn't know each other before, blending styles. And some of the things that make all teams good are things like trust and respect and honesty, courage. Those are some of the first things that come to mind as you know, really still keeping a positive environment present and available as you merge families. But you're right. It's a, I know, I know a lot of families who are in that position and I agree with you that there's not a lot of resources and talk about it. I'll prove it to the audience. I just made a note, right? <laughs> I just made a note. It's going to happen. When I make a note, it happens. Not next week, not this month, maybe, but that's going to happen because yeah, you know, the, the, there's a lot of questions that I get in my therapy office, you know, I mean, I just, you know, I, I talk about it all the time with people and so far as, you know, what, what is my role? How do I manage this relationship? And here's, here's a little nugget that I like to offer. I think it's a really good starting spot with this is, you know, the, the, the step parent is never a friend and is also never really a full parent. It's a step parent. Mm -hmm. So, but the age of onset of that relationship is crucial. Yes. Because the younger a kid is, the more like a parent you are, the older a kid is, the more like a friend you are. So if you step in as a step parent with a 15 year old buddy, you're just like, you know, okay, you're, you're my buddy, Bob. That's about it. Yeah, you know, yeah. 19, 18 years old. But when you're three, you're like, daddy. Yeah. Right. And there, and there's a big difference in, in how that, how that age at onset answers you know, kind of, and it's also, what do you want your role to be as a step parent? So yeah. th there's a lot there in that blending. I would be interested to know from your perspective, um, does it also matter the age of divorce? When the divorce happened, does that change the dynamic of a uh, step go, parent? Go more with that and let me think for a minute. Yeah, go, go more with that. Well, I'm just imagining like if your parents divorced when you were three, do you actually have a different need from a step parent? Even if that step parent didn't come into your life until you were 12. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> I don't have an answer, but I'm just a, curious, uh, to hear your opinion. This is why I love doing the show live. You're catching me with that. And, and that's, that's fascinating. I, I think I haven't thought about that angle as much. So you're saying, does it matter or what are the factors of the child experiencing divorce at a particular developmental state or time as it relates to like, you know, the kid might get through his family's divorce at age three versus age 14 and the step parent comes in at age 15. And so that three-year-old and 14 year old is going to have a very different experience. I think you're dead on. And, um, like when my parents got divorced, you know, I was like 10 or 11. You know, and, and and that was a tough time for me because it was the onset of all the teenage years. And mm -hmm. I mean, everything was just it was like thrown up in the air and stuff fell wherever the hell it fell. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was it was quite chaotic in my experience. And it was a little different from my brother. who's three years older. So there, there's a lot there, Cole. I think that, you know, the, the step parent from their perspective, they, they can't really do much about that anyway. The the the, the parent in bringing in the step parent probably has some considerations there that would take some thought and intervention. But, but honestly, I think particularly from the step parent, you know, the, the, the kid's 15. So whether it was divorce at age yeah. three or 14, the step parents got the same kind of, you know, thing going on. So from them, that's an easy answer for them. But the, but the parent is what you made me start thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. You the know? dynamic of the whole. Yeah. 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 I mean, you don't want to get, you know, throw your kids through a divorce situation in their family at age six. And then at age six and a half, you're bringing in a step parent, like, yeah. you know, Pete, come on. I mean, that might sound like common sense, but it's not necessarily <laughs> yeah. it's not. So, so there, there are some factors there. And I, I think you, you had, I don't know if I gave you an answer, but there's, there's a lot of dynamics there going on. Yeah. Okay. What do I want to get? Cause we're running down with time. Oh, here's a, here's a good one that I think is a big factor with this that we've kind of covered a little bit, you know, how, do, how does your perspective with total potential deal with things like, you know, our own childhood? And, you know, we mentioned it before, but the modeling and, you know, dealing with life experiences and, you know, how that contributes to what we're, what we're working with. 
you know, I yeah. think you mentioned be aware of yourself, right? I mean, that goes to that segment we were talking about. Yeah, that self-awareness piece. And, you know, I think this is an area where I think we have an opportunity to give ourselves a lot of grace because like what we said before, our parents, everyone's parents are doing the best they can with what they have. And so recognizing the things that maybe haven't served you overly well that are conditioned patterning from, <laughs> from your parent, from how you were parented, you know, offer some grace and understanding. Like I'm already thinking to myself, like, okay, I wonder what my kids are going to, you know, wish had not been their pattern. <laughs> right. right. But that self-awareness piece just, and this goes back to what you had said earlier, where it just allows you to have a choice. Do I want right. to keep that pattern? Does that pattern serve me? Or would I like a different pattern that's truer to myself? And so that's, I think that self-awareness piece is just Oh, it's super deep work. It's a lifetime of work. Like we're not going to have all the answers just because one day we noticed we have a certain pattern from our childhood, but that's also the exciting part. Like I always think like, I can't wait to be a hundred and pop up in bed and be like, I wonder what I get to work on today <laughs> because right. you know it's never ending. So, you know, and, and, and where I was, my brain is right now with listening to you is for instance, you know, there, there are people that grew up with an alcoholic dysfunctional family. Okay. That's a, that's a, a psychological buzz phrase that, you know, that you'll hear sometimes. And of course, there's a lot of destructiveness that you pick up with that. But hold on, not so fast. There's also some really cool things in there that I'm sure that you've learned, you know. So you take the good and you take the bad that, that, that are there. And by the way, there you have the facts of life. I'm sorry, I'm an 80s kid. I, you know, you ever hear that show? <laughs> yes, I love that show. <laughs> take the good, take the bad, and there you have. Yeah. But it's true because even in these really terrible situations, you're learning a lot and you're going to evaluate a lot. And in that self-awareness reality, you get to keep some of that stuff because yes. it's because it works for you. And, and, and just for instance, like, you know, the street smartness of it, you know, like we're going to have a reality approach in dealing with our kids. Because I learned real fast in my life as an adult child of an alcoholic that you better be real and real looking at real life and not living in a handsy pansy fake world. Yeah. You know, yeah. natural consequences and natural realities. You get to keep that. You get to choose that you keep that. Yeah. Well, and that's like we talked earlier a little bit about discomfort, right? And our kids are now like immune, like have no discomfort in their lives. And not that. Not that we right. want traumatic discomfort as like an opt-in, right? right? But there is a lot to learn from being uncomfortable. And even if that means you grew up in a dysfunctional family, that means you experienced a trauma at some point in your life. It means you were the kid who was bullied at school. Like you learned behaviors that allowed you to get through that. And that can become your superpower. Are there shadow sides of that where it can get dark and there's some work to do? For sure. But there are, we do learn skills and we have goodness that comes even from the rough stuff. Listen, I'm going to be revealing right now and, and be genuine. You know, there was a time in our life that I grew up eating government cheese. Okay. You know, we, we struggled and I'm glad for it. It now, not yeah. then. It yeah. Was tough then. Yeah. But you know, there, there's a lot of growth that comes from those types of things. And, you know, hats off to my mom. I love her. She's an amazing woman. It did amazing things for us, you know, during those times. And, and so, you know, yeah, I love what you're saying. And, 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 and there's a shadowy side to that, but you just got to shake those things out. And, and I love what you say, you know, about giving yourself grace. It, it, grace is such a powerful force. Yeah. Give your and spouse a little gratitude. some grace. Give yeah. your spouse some grace. Give your kids some grace. They need it. It's tough being mm -hmm. a kid, you know, and, 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 and how about the family culture of, of grace? Yeah. Right. right? Like that's how we respond to what happens. That's what we offer other people. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You want to see that model it. Foster Instead of it. a family culture of shame, family yeah. culture of lies. Or judgment. Or judgment. yeah, absolutely. Criticism. Criticism kills. Yeah. Kills the yeah. psyche. Right. And it's easy to fall into those things a little bit. You know, we're just, absolutely. again, we're not, not trying perfect. to be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> just trying to be aware and yeah. conscious and edge things into the direction that you choose. Love it. Yeah. How would you sum us up anything that we missed? And then we're going to give the transition. No, thank you. This has been such a fun conversation and I'm really excited. You know, I think one of the highlights for me of this conversation is just that it is those little tweaks. And that's what we talk about over and over again in the book. Like 
what are the small, meaningful changes that you can make that matter to you? Aren't the things that somebody else told you you were supposed to do that set your life on a path that you want to go on, you know, and that your family can really thrive in because you made that one little tweak, one thing at a time. But I'm super excited to have the chance to take this to a little bit different area with our conversation with you on our podcast, because we get to dive deep into some of the marriage insecurities. And I can't wait to talk about it awesome so before we get to that i should be able to remember october the 12th because it's my mother's birthday (laughs) but in the case that i don't you need to make a promise that you give me a little email or a pop or a text or something that gives me a little bit of a plug and a a, a memory perk to uh, to check out total uh potential is the name of the book right october the 12th okay thank you for that so i I may be focused on my mom that day i don't know (laughs) but So, yeah, we have a transition through a therapist-sized tribe. Check out Total Potential. We're going to be recording Monday, so it'll come out when, and how do they find it? It will be the following Tuesday. So, let's see. My days are blurring together. I already, many times today, couldn't believe I said that it was July 1st. I was like, what? I know. So, it'll be out on uh, Tuesday, July 13th. And you can find the Total Potential podcast on Spotify and Apple and all those fun places or through TotalPotentialFamilyWellness.com, which is the website. So we'll we'll have it there. Totally, totally PotentialFamilyWellness.com. Yeah, Total Potential. Yes, FamilyWellness.com. Awesome. Okay, so here's what we do. Remember I told you to have a memory? So whenever people are sharing on the show, I just think it's a, it's a spot of courage. This is not an easy thing to do. We're being shot around the world literally. And, you know, the, the courage that you showed to share with us your, your views and some of the personal touches, you know, I really appreciate. And so to signify that, I like to do a high five. Now you're not here. So in, in the moment, I'm going to count three, two, one, and then we'll give a clap that okay. signifies a high five. You, you down I with that? I can handle that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we got three, two, one. All right. I love it. I really appreciate you hanging out with us and we will see you uh, in my world on Monday. Yeah. And, a couple uh, days. The, the guys and gals here will find you on Total Total Potential is the is the podcast. So guys, have a great week. I'm going to get busy with Cole on that marriage topic on, on their show. So take care and have a great uh, 4th of July, though you may not hear this until after. I hope you had a great 4th of July. Take care, everybody. Bye.